Welcome, everyone. As you can see, this is yours truly, attorney Michael Cord, a.k.a. Michael X, a.k.a. the angriest black man in America. And um, that whole angriest word is really appropriate, extremely appropriate for the beginning of today's show. But when I say angry, I don't mean in a destructive way. I actually mean in a constructive way, because we all know James Baldwin said to be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage. And I do have that rage, but I promise you it's going to be a constructive rage. Uh, it's in connection with Black Wall Street. And obviously we're broadcasting and recording the show today, Friday, June 4. But just a few days ago, it was exactly 100 years ago to the very day that black folks and black property weren't just destroyed and murdered, but it was a mass murder. It was a wholesale murder. It was an incineration. But I'm going to talk about that in more detail in just a couple of seconds. Thank you all for tuning in to TV Courtroom. And uh, the focus, the focus of today's show is Juneteenth. Juneteenth will be celebrated in a couple of weeks, and there's an organization that's laying the foundation to make history again here in Philadelphia. You might wonder, what do I mean when I say make history again? But our guest will explain it, and we're going to have a guest gentleman by the name of Gary Shepard. If you know anything about radio and TV in Philadelphia over the last, I don't know, 25 years or so, you know my guest, Gary Shepard. So stay tuned. In about 12, 13 minutes, he will be on. We'll talk about Juneteenth and you'll be enlightened. But before he does that, and again, please understand today's show is about Juneteenth first and foremost. And I encourage you, contact family and friends and relatives because what we're going to share with you is it's almost like a history lesson, but it's not a boring history lesson. It's the history lesson where you are enlightened and motivated and inspired and activated, we hope, because we have an event coming up and we really, really want you to participate. But again, before we get to that, and we'll have our guests shortly, um, I started out today's show by saying that I'm angry. And I'm angry because I just spent the past week discussing Black Wall Street. Why? Because this past Monday and Tuesday, which was May 31, 2021, and June 1, 2021, which means for that two-day period, it was exactly 100 years ago to the very day that one of the worst, correction, the worst racial attack in a single incident in American history. Now think about that. America has attacked people of color quite often. And for something to be the worst of that often, often speaks volumes. I write a column for the Philadelphia Tribune and um, actually, I write two columns for the Philadelphia Tribune. I write one that comes out every Sunday. It's called Freedom's Journal, and it deals with issues by, for, and of Black folks. That's the weekly Sunday edition, Philadelphia Tribune. And I've been writing that for, I don't know, four or five years or so, and it blew up. It turned out so well that the management at the Philadelphia Tribune said, hey, Mike, we love what you're doing. Can you write a second column? But this time, focus on black economics. And I said, say no more. So beginning a couple months ago, I started a second column at the Tribune called Black Dollars Matter. And this pad, and that comes out once a month, first Tuesday, every month. And big shout out to our producer, our engineer, Roland, because he did include, as you saw on the bottom left-hand corner, um, the website to the Philadelphia Tribune. And anyway, the first Tuesday of every month, my Black Dollars Matter column comes out. And this past week, this past Tuesday, I wrote in connection with Black Dollars Matter, I wrote about Black Wall Street. Why? Because before white people murdered and incinerated Black Wall Street, it was the wealthiest community in America. 
wealthiest black community in America. And I'm going to assume that many of you or some of you don't really know anything about Black Wall Street. So let me give you Black Wall Street 101, just the basics. Um, I told you about the articles I write in the Tribune and in this past Tuesday's edition, listen to what I wrote. Let me read to you specifically verbatim what it says because it speaks volume. That whole thing I said about being angry, here we go. This is verbatim from the article. Apoplectic, ballistic, enraged, furious, incensed, infuriated, irate, livid, outraged, seething. Those aforementioned 10 words don't come close to how I feel every single second I think about what happened exactly 100 years ago to the very day during an 18 hour period from May 31 through June 1, 1921, when devils fired murderous hell down on the prosperous, self-sufficient and completely innocent Black Wall Street community of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a Black community that was the wealthiest in the country. Let me just read a few more sentences and I'll get back to the discussion, but I continue by writing, the words I really want to use are profane, violent, and threatening. However, I will not use them here in the Tribune because I have too much respect for the civility and professionalism of this prestigious, historic black newspaper. But catch me on the street and privately ask me what I really think, and I'll tell you in no uncertain terms. And don't even think about asking me to forgive and turn the other cheek. Black folks have done so much cheek turning since 1619 that we've lost most of our face and most of our behinds. Malcolm was right in his 1964, the ballot or the bullet speech, when he wisely said, quote, stop singing and start swinging. So that's how I started out the article. And again, you can see that I was enraged and I was enraged for good reason. And the good reason is this, those people I described as devils. And when I say devils, I don't mean any particular ethnic or racial group. When I say a person is a devil, this is what I mean. A devil is what a devil does. So if you do devilment, you're a devil. And that's why I call them devils who did this thing because only devils would do that type of devilment. What did they do specifically? Let me count the ways. They murdered 300 black men, black women and black children over an 18 hour orgy of horrific, bloodthirsty violence. Think about that. From one day to the next, 18 nonstop hours of blood and gore and murder. Men, women, and children. None were saved. None were rescued. How'd they do it? They did it through gunfire and flame fire. They actually had military assault weapons from World War I that they used in this attack, in this assault on black folks. They used flame fire. What's flame fire? They actually had World War I airplanes that they filled with gasoline bombs and just dropped those gasoline bombs down on innocent black men, innocent black women and innocent black children, slaughtered at least 300, and some say it was as many as four or 500. At least 800 to 1,000 were seriously injured and hospitalized. Now that's the destruction of life. It was also mass destruction of property. That gunfire I mentioned, that flame fire I mentioned, destroyed 35 to 40 black streets where black folks live. And during that 
destruction of those 35 to 40 streets in the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, there were at least 1,300 black homes all destroyed. There were 200 black businesses. Remember what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about 2021 in the North. I'm talking about 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Black folks, 1,300 homes. Black folks, 200 prosperous businesses, including, but not limited to, 30 grocery stores owned by black people, 21 churches owned by black people, over 20 restaurants owned by black people. Think about that, but it doesn't stop there. Several law offices, if we had more time, I could tell you about one particular lawyer who was a hero, even after his law office building was firebombed. So we got over 200 businesses, including 30 grocery stores, including 21 churches, including more than 20 restaurants, including several law offices, all owned and operated by black people, six single plane transport airlines. Let me repeat that because you might've thought I misspoke. Black people had airplanes in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They had money like that, six single plane transport airlines, and there were only two airports in the entire state of Oklahoma. And right there in Greenwood, black folks had six single plane transport airlines. You want more, I'll give you more. They had two movie theaters, they had a school, they had a hospital, they had a bank, they had a bus system, they had a post office, they had a library. They had all this stuff. And black, and black folks, men, women, and children were murdered and incinerated, at least 300 of them. Some people say as many as 500. Why? Because they were black, because they had money. And the story goes that it was sparked by, and we got to get to our guest in one minute, so I'm going to wrap this up. But I just want you to know why I said I was so angry. Um, here's the background, and I'll give you the condensed version, because we got to hear from our guest. Monday... May 30, 1921, a black man, 19 years old, named Dick Rowland, is getting off the elevator in a building where a department store is located. There's a 17-year-old white girl, Sarah Page, who's the elevator operator. As Dick Rowland is leaving the elevator, he loses his balance, stumbles, and bumps against Sarah Page. She does her quote-unquote Karen thing, running out, yelling that he was trying to sexually assault her, and he later gets arrested. A local white newspaper called the Tulsa Tribune immediately got a copy of the police report and said, Negro rapes white woman. And then the headline of that news article said, Negro to be lynched tonight. Now remember, that's on Monday, May 30, 1921. Well, when white folks saw that newspaper article, it hit the fan, but that was just an excuse. Yeah, we know that they kill black men for allegedly looking the wrong way at white women, but it was bigger than that. It was these uppity Negroes with all this money, all this wealth, all this self-sufficiency. Black folks even had indoor plumbing systems, whereas most of the white people in Tulsa had to use outhouses. So they were extremely jealous. They found an excuse, and that excuse meant that 300 black men, women, and children were murdered and incinerated. And 35 black streets filled with 1,300 homes were incinerated. I got so much more I want to share with you, but to the extent that what I just shared with you is the problem, let's now talk about the solution. And the solution is building upon the destruction of Black Wall Street. And when I say building upon, one of the things I didn't include him, we're about to go to our guest now, and I'm going to introduce you to him. And I really don't have to, because like I said at the outset, if you know anything about radio and TV in Philadelphia, you already know him and his impressive resume. One of the things I didn't mention at the outset about Black Wall Street, this is Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. The dollar circulated between 36 and 100 times in that community before it left. I gotta repeat that. The dollar 
in Black Wall Street, Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, circulated between 36 and 100 times before it left. How? Because the white people did their own thing through segregation. And the black people said, we're not going to protest and demonstrate and sit in to beg you to take our money. We'll build our own thing and we'll patronize our own thing. So the black banks worked with the black restaurants. The black restaurants worked with the black churches. The black churches worked with the black supermarkets and so on and so forth. All these black businesses, all these black people were self-sufficient. They didn't beg white people and no disrespect to Dr. King and the civil rights movement. I understand his approach to integration and I'm a lawyer today because of what Dr. King and my elders and ancestors fought for. But with all due respect, the better approach is to do for self, to do what those black folks did in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Having said that, let me introduce our guest and we'll talk more about that concept relative to Juneteenth. My guest today is Gary Shepard. And as I said before, if you know anything about radio and TV in Philadelphia, you know all about him. He has a wealth of experience in both radio and TV, not just doing it right here in Philly, but in Michigan, in Florida, in New Jersey, pretty much all over the country as a morning and afternoon drive personality, a newsman, a news director, a music director, a program director. I mean, this guy is the man. In addition, he's the founder of Gary Shepherd Enterprises. If I told you all about him, we'd be here till midnight. So <laughs> cut to the chase. He is a key part of the plan for Juneteenth. And I say the plan, it's actually a twofold plan regarding a national holiday in Philadelphia as the headquarters, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Without further ado, my good friend, and hopefully yours, the esteemed Gary Shepard. How are you today? I'm doing well, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Uh, loud and clear, crystal clear. Good, um, good, good. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you. You know a little bit about radio and TV and internet and IT stuff, so you're the pro with this. So even apart from your technical expertise, talk to us now about this Juneteenth thing. But well, first, of all, first well, of all, I wanted to say thank you for covering that uh, Tulsa and Black Wall Street and all of that, because uh, I remember, you know, just back in the day, many, many years ago when I was on radio, we would play songs by a group called the Gap Band. The yes. Wilson, the Wilson brothers. Yes. Charlie Wilson and his brothers. And I would say all the time when I played that, I said they come from a, a section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, bordered Ooh. by streets called Greenwood, Archer and Pine. That's where Gap came from. And that area was known as Black Wall Street. So I'm embarrassed, Gary, to say I just found that out last year. Is that right? <laughs> I know about the Gap band. I know all their greatest hits. Uh -huh. Yeah, never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, and I haven't been on radio for the past 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can imagine we were talking about that in, in the 70s and, and in the Absolutely. 80s and, and, and all of that. So thank you for uh, getting that word out. And thank you for all the good work that you do, Mike. I appreciate you. Well, now, coming talking, from, about, talking about Juneteenth, it's coming yes. up, obviously, and it has received more and wider recognition. As you well know, in 2019, the governor uh, signed a uh, uh, into law that Juneteenth is, is an observed holiday in Pennsylvania. So um, it is official now here in Pennsylvania, but what we're trying to do is to make Juneteenth a national federal holiday. And we'll be starting that off on Juneteenth. Actually, it's something going on right now because there will not be a parade just like it was because we're still in a pandemic. Let us not mm -hmm. forget that. Amen. We are allowed to do a march. That march is in support of Juneteenth becoming a national holiday. It's all going to kick off at 52nd and Haverford in West Philadelphia, right there at the Spectrum Health Building. There'll be a rally there. Congressman um, Dwight Evans will be speaking. Uh, Senator Vincent Hughes has been invited. We've got Jamie Gautier, City Council Member Jamie Gautier, who'll be speaking as well. Sarah Lomax Reese will be speaking as well. And as you know, because you're going to be there, Mike, WURD is broadcasting live from 9 to 11 at that site. Now, during that period of time, it'll be a live broadcast. There's also a men's health clinic taking place in the parking lot of Spectrum. And then afterwards, we will march starting at 11 o'clock down to Malcolm X Park. At the park, there will be featured 
uh, artwork from young black artists. We've been in uh, contact and in partnership with the mural arts program. So the young black artists will display some of their work that relates to Juneteenth. It's going to be on printed. It'll be photographs of their work with a QR code. If somebody is interested in buying that artwork or interested in talking to the artist, they can then go scan that QR code and take them directly to that artist. In addition to that, there will be some vendors there as well in the park and across the street, a food distribution will take place at the GLA school. So it's a lot of activity going on. Uh, the whole purpose is to have Juneteenth become a national holiday and to make Philadelphia the epicenter of that Juneteenth celebration. People come into Philadelphia to celebrate Juneteenth because there's a lot going on here. You know, Gary, as I'm listening to you, um, not only is what you're saying important in terms of substance, but the way you enunciate it, even the sound of your voice is so impressive in form. Has anyone ever suggested to you that you get into the radio or TV? <laughs> you know, people say all, all the time, you know, oh, you got a good radio voice. I'm like, well, you know, that's that's just my voice. Hey, Amen. And, and it's, it sounds great. Talk a little bit about that second part of your comment. Gary, where you talked about Philadelphia being the epicenter. What do you mean by that? So, so Philadelphia is known as the birthplace of America, obviously. And we are looking at the true Freedom Day, which is June 19th, Juneteenth, that since the United States of America started here in Philadelphia, why not celebrate true Freedom Day right here in Philadelphia? You know, bring people on board. We've been working with Greg DeShields of PHL Diversity. He's with the Convention and Visitors Bureau as well. So this messaging is going out across the country. Come to Philadelphia to celebrate Juneteenth. Now, as you well know, also, some of the restrictions have been lifted as far as COVID is concerned. So we, we are still asking people, make sure you wear your mask. You know, I have my mask right here with me. Yeah, make sure you continue to wear your mask and observe all those CDC guidelines as well as the city restrictions that still may be in place. A lot of them have been lifted, and I believe by June 19th, probably most of them will be lifted except for indoors. But we're still asking people to wear masks outdoors. So that's what we're talking about, having Philadelphia be the epicenter of the celebration of Juneteenth, True Freedom Day. That is powerful. Let me ask you this, Gary. I want to play the devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Could you all do this thing in West Philly? Why don't you do it in Center City where the restaurants are and the hotels are and the big businesses? Why in the hood? Which well, you, you know what? It was done in Center City initially. It was a couple of parades in Center mm -hmm. City when we started doing this Juneteenth celebration. However, there was some research and some thought put into it and said, you know, what black business or black people will be um, benefiting from having Juneteenth in Center City? Not too many. So when you think about West Philadelphia, 52nd Street is historical as the concentration, the largest concentration of African-Americans in the city of Philadelphia. So when we had the parade in 2019, it drew over 25,000 people participating in the parade, Ooh. as well as those people who were coming in to support the parade. And as a result of that, a lot of those uh, businesses who are black owned were benefiting from that. And this concept was taken by a parade known as the Bud Billiken Parade out in yes. Chicago. Yes. It, it marches right through the heart of the black community of Chicago. So we said, hey, why not an Ali and, and Helen and, and, and Mike and Mike Rashid and Sonny and Felicia, we all came together and said, that's a great idea. Let's move it to West Philadelphia. It had the biggest attendance and the most success in 2019 when it was moved to 52nd Street. Woo, I love it, I love it. You just threw out some names there, including Ali Salahuddin. Talk mm -hmm. to some of the other people who are involved. And I know I'm putting you on the spot because you're probably gonna name several. And after the show, you're gonna remember, oh no, I forgot. Oh, yeah, I left somebody out. <laughs> Absolutely, but to the extent that right now you can remember, remember certain names, who else is involved in this in terms of so organizing? So the, the, the Pennsylvania Juneteenth Initiative Planning Committee consists of uh, Ali Salahuddin, who is the COO, Chief Operating mm -hmm. Officer, Helen Salahuddin, who is uh, acting as our attorney and legal advice on that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of Felicia Harris-Williams, who is a planner and just a dynamic young woman, 
uh, Sonny King, who's also working, he's the program mm -hmm. coordinator and coordinates all of that and everything that comes together. Uh, and then myself, and then of course we have our CEO in absentia, I guess, is uh, Michael Rashid. Uh, mm. Obviously, Michael Rashid is the Commerce Director, so yes. he's devoted to that job. He hasn't been involved in any of our meetings or anything like that because we didn't want to give any uh, a break from Friday, anything like that. So, so those are that's the core group of people we work with. Of course, there are a lot of other people, vendors we're working with uh, to to make sure that the messaging gets out. Uh, my team has been involved in producing a dynamite video, and the one thing I didn't. Uh, didn't mention is since there is no parade, we came up with the concept to do a float house competition. Decorate your house like a float for Juneteenth, Whoa. support of it becoming a national holiday. And here's the best part, Mike. There are four categories. You can decorate your private home, your business, your nonprofit, or your entire block. And the top uh, decorated place in each of those categories will receive a $1,000 cash prize. Whoa. Big, big doings. Those who just tuned in, you're listening to the smooth and mellifluous voice. And I do mean that because you got a smooth voice there, but it's not just the form, it's the substance. And by the way, Gary, this was supposed to be maybe a 10, 12 minute interview, but you're on a roll so much. We're going to keep you for an extra few minutes. <laughs> if you're fine. Those who just tuned in, you're listening to and looking at Gary Shepard has a wealth of experience in radio and TV, not just here in Philadelphia, but in Michigan, in Florida, New Jersey, and pretty much all over the country as a morning and afternoon drive personality, as well as a newsman, news director, music director, and program director. You can't talk about radio and TV in Philadelphia unless that conversation includes the name Gary Shepard. Gary, you talked about your team, and I know a little bit about Third Floor Media. Talk a little bit about that and what your team is doing. Well, well, Third Floor Media, uh, of course, is a boutique advertising agency with full production capability. What we've done is produce that video that explains about the Float House contest. Uh, contest. And what I'm going to do, Mike, is make sure you have that link so you can see it. I don't know if you've seen it already. I have not. Okay. I'm going to make sure you have that link so you can see it and then spread it out to, to your viewers and your listeners as well. And and when I mention about, and, 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 and I'm thinking about this too, when I mention about the broadcast of WURD. I understand you're going to be the host of that on June yes. 2nd from 9 to 11. Am I correct? Yes. With that? yes, sir. That's me. Okay. Well, see, you're part of our team as well. So you're, you've just been adopted. I love it. I love it. And what so we let me do ask is you. also place no, radio commercials. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, please continue. No, I was going to say we place radio commercials. We produced and placed radio commercials on WURD. Our television uh, partner is 6ABC. They've been for the last several years now. They've done a fantastic job in terms of supporting and making sure the word about Juneteenth gets out. WURD is the radio uh, partner, but we also have other radio partners as well. So people understand the importance of this holiday. And it's, it's not just a big party. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can celebrate. We can celebrate achievements, the things that have been accomplished by our young people, by our senior citizens. We can celebrate those achievements, but we also have to understand the importance of this day, how it came about, what it is, and why we should celebrate it. You know, you laid that out so very well, and you talked about the importance of Juneteenth. I want you to explain what you mean about that. You know, what if somebody says, especially a young person, what is this old black history stuff, this slavery stuff? This is 156 years old. How is that relevant in 2021? Why is that important? I heard this guy, Gary Shepard, on this TV courtroom show, and he said it's important. Why is it important? So, Mr. Shepard, I'm asking you, why is it important after 156 years? Well, I, I would have to say to, to the young folks, a lot of things that you're doing today and you take for granted, okay, we, we didn't have that. Our people, our ancestors couldn't even think about that because of the fact they were in bondage. And the things that they went through in terms of making sure that we've got certain freedoms and, and we continue to fight for this, this what's called diversity, equity and inclusion now. Uh, so the, the things that you're doing right now, the way that you're wearing your clothes, the way you wear your hair, the places you go visit, the places you can get on an airplane to go see, 
our ancestors weren't able to do those kinds of things. So it's important to recognize those people who came before us who realized two and a half years after that officially it was stated, your freedom is granted, they didn't know. So they worked for an additional two and a half years of free labor. So that's very, very important. We cannot forget that. We can't forget our history because if we do, we're doomed to repeat it and, and, and just fail. You know, this is being recorded and I'm glad it is because it needs to be shared to high schools and junior high schools all around the country. In less than three minutes, you laid out why it's relevant. And when I say you, those just tuned in, I'm talking about Gary Shepard, a gentleman with a wealth of experience in radio and TV, not only here in Philadelphia, but pretty much across the country, Michigan and Florida and New Jersey. He served as a newsman, a news director, a music director, a program director, just doing what needs to be done in radio and TV. And you heard about third floor media. Um, Gary, this show is called TV Courtroom. Mm -hmm. And at many courtroom proceedings, at the end, you have a closing argument. So we're going to put you on the spot as a kind of Johnny Cochran to give us a closing argument. Uh, whatever amount of time you need, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, um, just share with us what you think you need to highlight, what you think you need to add, what you think you need to repeat about the upcoming Juneteenth here in Philly and include it in your closing argument, Gary. Also walk us through the planning. You did lay it out early on, but mm -hmm. if I want you to repeat that. And also in your closing argument, just tell us what you think is most important about the event. So, so Mike, first of all, I wanna thank you for inviting me to, to have me here today to talk about Juneteenth and the importance of it. I just think back, uh, you know, I'm a child of the 60s. And when I was growing up, you know, we had we had a black mayor in our town. I grew up right outside of Detroit, a suburb called Inkster, Michigan. Some people watching now may know and have heard of a group called the Marvelettes, a big motel. Mm, okay. That's where they're from, and that's where I'm from. Uh, in, in Inkster, we had a black supermarket. We had a black cleaners. We had Whoa. black funeral homes. We had a black television station in Detroit. We had black owned radio stations. And I'm talking about back in the 60s. So wow. I like to see that come back. I mean, that's the kind of consciousness under which I grew up. Black newspaper. We had those back in the 60s. And I, and I like to see that come back around because when you talk about the city of Philadelphia with a population of anywhere between 42 and 46 percent African-American, it depends on what statistics you look at. And the business ownership is only between 2.3 and 2.5 percent. That's atrocious. So it's important. First of all, we recognize Juneteenth. We want you to come out 52nd and Haverford, Juneteenth, June 19th, Saturday morning, beginning at nine o'clock. Hear the important speakers there to talk about the legislation that's pending in Congress right now. And you can lend your voice to have that legislation be passed and have Juneteenth become a national federal holiday. Gary Shepard, thank you very much for spending time with us. Thank you for getting folks hyped up. I know I'm hyped up after hearing what you said, so I know other people are. I want to thank you for spending time with us. We're supposed to have you on for, I don't know, eight to 10 minutes. It went on for about 15, 16, 17. I hope we didn't step on too many of your toes by <laughs> time like that. But one final thing I want to say, Gary, before you go, in mm -hmm. regards to Third Floor Media, folks want more information about that. Uh, is there a website? Is there a phone number, email address? How do they find out more about that? Our website is very simple. The number three FM. Oh, wait, where am I? Here am I right here. Three FM. Okay. And by the way, Gary, before you go on, I see our producer included that right beneath you. So it's right there, but please state it anyway. Okay, it's three FM dot FM. Very simple. Three FM dot FM. And I did that originally as a play on my radio background. Yes. But as you look at our website, you will see that a camera appears behind that. So we're producing video, we're producing audio, we're placing commercials on, on radio stations, out of home, billboards, newspaper, digital, all of that. Gary Shepard, thank you very much, not only for spending time with us, but for the great work you do in and around Philadelphia. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. Be safe. God bless you. Thank you. All right. That was a great interview. I mean, Gary Shepard is, as you can see, so smooth with this. You can tell that he has the type of expertise that I mentioned. Big shout out to Gary Shepard. Also, big shout out to our producer extraordinaire.
who just, as you noticed, was including information in the bottom of the screen so that you would know who to contact or how to contact that person. We have about maybe 22 minutes left. And what I wanna do in those final 22 minutes is go into a little more detail about Juneteenth. Gary Shepard did an excellent job with the overview. I wanna to try to spend some time going to some specificity about it. So you heard Gary talk about this whole two and a half year late thing, and I'm gonna get into that. But folks, get your pens out, get your pads out, because what I'm going to do at this point is to give you a history lesson. And this is not something I came up with after Googling last night. I've actually written articles about this in the Philadelphia Tribune, and I'm gonna to refer to some of those, but it goes like this. When we talk about Juneteenth, we're talking about 156 years ago in Galveston, Texas, when formerly enslaved, in fact, I wanna be clear about the date we're talking about because it's going to, you'll understand why it's called Juneteenth. Remember what I just said, 156 years ago, Galveston, Texas, June 19, 1865, formerly enslaved black people. And we try to go out of our way by not referring to them as slaves because they weren't slaves. They weren't ex-slaves. They were formerly enslaved human beings. People often say they kidnapped slaves out of Africa. No, they didn't kidnap slaves out of Africa. They kidnapped soldiers and doctors and fishermen and mothers and fathers and kings and queens and princes and princesses. They took from our motherland human beings doing the work that humans do. So don't say they were slaves. Don't say that slaves were taken out of Africa. Africans were taken by force out of Africa. So let me begin once again. We're talking about 156 years ago. We're talking about Galveston, Texas. We're talking about June 19, 1865, when formerly enslaved blacks in that state finally received official, and that's key here, official confirmation of their supposed freedom. I'm gonna explain later why I call it supposed freedom, but for purpose of our discussion, let's just call it freedom right now. And as Gary Shepard pointed out, this was two and a half years late. But despite the fact that it came late, better late than never, those 250,000 formerly enslaved black folks celebrated enthusiastically. Now, you might say, well, Mike, well, why is it called Juneteenth? Juneteenth is not a real word. Well, yeah, it is a real word. It's what we call in the English language a portmanteau. What is a portmanteau? A portmanteau is where you have a linguistic blend of words that fuse sounds and meanings. So you blend words and you blend sounds to create a new word. And that's exactly what our formerly enslaved ancestors did after they got their supposed freedom. They took June, they took 19th, and created that thing called a portmanteau and came up with Juneteenth. In addition to calling it Juneteenth, they also had other names. They called it Freedom Day. They called it Emancipation Day. They called it Jubilee Day. And they called it Black Independence Day. They called it what they needed to call it because for them, it was the beginning of freedom. Now, Gary Shepard alluded to this. He actually talked about this. It's the oldest celebration commemorating the purported end of slavery in America. So if that's true, and it is, it is our Black Independence Day. And it's officially observed in 47 states as well as DC. Remember what I just said, officially observed. That's a step in the right direction, but it really means nothing. It pretty much is where you see something, you acknowledge it, and you keep it moving. So the fact that 47 states and DC officially observed it, and you might say, what do I mean by that? If the governor simply wrote a resolution or the mayor wrote a resolution saying, I hereby officially observe Juneteenth. But that's it. It means nothing else except that it has no force of law. It's just an official statement 
from an official in that state or in that city. So when people say it's officially recognized or officially observed in 47 states and DC, what are you black folks complaining about? What we're complaining about is that having it officially recognized or officially observed really means nothing. It means something only when it's a paid holiday. And it's only a paid holiday in three states, Texas, where Juneteenth came from, Virginia, and right here in Pennsylvania. So Juneteenth is a paid holiday only in those three states, Texas, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, but not by the federal government. In fact, the federal government hasn't done what needed to be done, but it's moving in the right direction. And what Ali Salahuddin is working on, what Gary Shepard just talked about, and probably a dozen other folks here in Philadelphia, our goal on June, Juneteenth here in Philly, June 19th here in Philly, is to begin a groundswell of support to make it a federal holiday. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel because folks have already started it. Big shout out to Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, a Democrat from Texas. She introduced House Resolution 7232. Write that down and Google it. HR 7232 by Congressperson Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, a Democrat from Texas. And she introduced this back on June 18, 2020. That's on the House side. Remember, Congress includes two parts. There's the House side and there's the Senate side. Big shout out to Senator Edward Markey, a Democrat from Massachusetts. He introduced on the Senate side, Senate Bill 4019. And he did this about four days later on June 22, 2020. So in the House, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee introduced it in 2020 on June 18. On the Senate, Senator Edward Markey on the Senate side, Senator Edward Markey introduced it four days later on June 22, 2020. And what they both say is, we are introducing a bill for passage of something called Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. That's what the bill is called, Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. And if that proposal, if that bill becomes law, then Juneteenth nationwide on the federal level would be an official paid holiday. Once again, big shout out to Congresswoman Jackson Lee and big shout out to Senator Markey. Now you might hear something about what the Republicans claim to have done. Well, there's something called Senate Resolution 620. And that's by a Republican Senator from Texas, John Cornyn. And he did this back on June 15, 2020. And it really doesn't do anything with all due respect. I mean, it's called Juneteenth Independence Day, but it doesn't take a step toward making Juneteenth an official national paid holiday. It's simply just Congress, or in this case, the Senate, simply saying to Juneteenth, hey, what's up? Just like speaking to you, walking down the street, somebody speaks to you, but they keep moving. You know, you might be stumbling, you might be falling, you might be on the ground. They walk by you to say, hey man, what's up? But they don't reach down to help you. That's exactly what Senator John Cornyn from Texas as a Republican has done. Let me read to you what his resolution does. It really does nothing. It merely, quote, designates June 19, 2020 as Juneteenth Independence Day. Well. That, that's not, that doesn't mean anything. It also recognizes the historical significance of Juneteenth Independence Day. Okay, that's, that's no big deal. In addition, it supports the continued nationwide celebration of Juneteenth Independence Day. I, I'm not really feeling that. And finally, it recognizes that the observance of the end of slavery is part of the history of the United States. But yeah, all that stuff I mean, yeah, it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't do anything. It reminds me of that classic line 
uh, from Macbeth, where Macbeth said, it's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's pretty much what it is. So I'm not really feeling Senate Resolution 620, but I am feeling House Resolution 7232 by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Google it and support it. And I'm really feeling Senate Bill 4019 by Senator Edward Markey from Massachusetts. Having said all that regarding the politics, put that to the side. Let me now for the next approximately 10 minutes jump into the history. And this is what Gary Shepard, my esteemed guest a few minutes ago, uh, touched on. Um, here's the history. Nearly two and a half years before the Civil War ended, follow me on this, I'm gonna speak slowly. I really need you to write this down to remember it, because this is some real history that they don't teach in the schools. But here it is again, nearly two and a half years before the Civil War ended, and it ended on May 9, 1865. So nearly two years before the end of the Civil War, which occurred on May 9, 1865, and this happened after after the surrender of Confederate General Robert E. Lee a month earlier. That's background stuff, you don't need to know that. Now, remember, nearly two and a half years before the Civil War ended on May 9, 1865, Abe Lincoln on September 22, 1862, announced that the Emancipation Proclamation would go into effect on January 1, 1863. Now I included a lot of dates there, but as you see, Brother Malcolm is behind me and over my shoulder, and Brother Malcolm teaches me to make it plain. So I'm gonna make it plain. Here's what we're talking about. Two and a half years, nearly two and a half years before the Civil War ended in May of 1865, Abe Lincoln in September of 1862 said, hey, I'm issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm announcing it here in September of 1862, but it's not gonna go into effect until January 1, 1863. So you got those dates together? The end of the Civil War, May 9, 1865. But two and a half years before that, on September 22, 1862, Abe Lincoln said, hey, everybody, I want you all to know that I'm going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm quote unquote freeing the slaves, but it's not going to go into effect until about four months from now, and that would be January 1, 1863. Now, before I continue with the history of Juneteenth relative to that, let me just tell you about this nonsense we call the Emancipation Proclamation. In fact, let me do this in sake of time. We got about less than 12 minutes left. Let me read to you what I wrote in the Philadelphia Tribune. Here's what I wrote, I wrote this a few years ago. It must be noted that Abe Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation wasn't even worth the paper it was written on because it did not really end slavery and it did not really free any of the approximately four million enslaved blacks. You wanna know why? I'll tell you why because it included only the Confederate states that were in rebellion. It excluded enslaved populations in Northern states. So if there were enslaved people in the North, too bad, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't apply to you. So remember, it only applied to Confederate states in rebellion and excluded enslaved populations in Northern states, as well as specifically in Maryland, doesn't apply. Delaware doesn't apply. Tennessee doesn't apply. And West slash Southwest Virginia doesn't apply. And Lower Louisiana doesn't apply. So why did Abe Lincoln issue it? Well, it was a political stunt. It was a political stunt such that if Black people heard about the Emancipation Proclamation and left the plantations, now the soldiers from the South, now the soldiers from the Confederacy would not only have to be soldiers, 
it would also have to work on their own plantations. And you can be a soldier effectively, and you can be a plantation worker effectively, but you can't be both effectively. So Abe Lincoln wasn't really freeing people because it had no impact. In fact, he even said it doesn't apply to many states. So why did you issue it? Well, it was a political stunt. You might say, OK, Mike, that might be true. But what about the 13th Amendment? Maybe the, the Emancipation Proclamation really wasn't anything. But certainly later on, 13th Amendment was good. Nah, not really. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate the fact that it was the step toward our freedom. But I don't want you to think that the 30th Amendment says slavery is over, y'all free. It didn't say that. In fact, the 13th Amendment, which was ratified on December 6th of 1865, here's what it says. I told you what it didn't say. Now I'm going to tell you what it does say. It did not say Black people who are enslaved are free, period. It did not say black people who are enslaved are free, exclamation point. Here's what it said, quote, black people are free except for punishment for crime after having been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. What does all that mean? Brother Malcolm saying, make it plain. It means that we can't enslave you for being black but we can enslave you if you're a criminal. So what did the South do? They passed laws called the Black Codes. And the Black Codes were nonsensical laws that were designed to re-enslave the recently freed, formerly enslaved people. Laws like vagrancy, laws like loitering, laws like being near a railroad line. Just some crazy laws to make black people convicts. And once they're convicts, you can hold them in jail. I wish I had time to talk to you about this documentary, but I can tell you about it. Google a documentary called Slavery by Another Name. Slavery by Another Name, you can find it on YouTube. It's produced by WHYY. You gotta check out Slavery by Another Name because it tells you that as bad as slavery was, and it was horrific from 1619, I got to tell you, Roland is right on point. He's showing you now the documentary on PBS, available WHYY in Philly, but you got to check it out. Slavery was horrific between 1619 and 1865, but the South got the North to compromise with that tricky language in the 30th Amendment. And what happened is they now said, okay, you can't enslave black people for being black, but you can enslave them for being criminals. So South, all they got to do is pass some crazy new laws. Like I said, vacancy. Vacancy simply means today, what it meant back in 1865. If you're out in public with no visible means of support, you're a vagrant. If you're a vagrant, you're a criminal. If you're a criminal, you get arrested. If you get arrested, you taken to jail. If you're taken to jail, you have a trial. If you lose the trial, you go to jail. Think about that. They created these laws to get you arrested. When you got arrested, they took you to court. When you went to court, you had a trial. When you had a trial, you lost. When you lost, you were found guilty. When you were found guilty, you got to pay a fine, but you can't pay a fine because you're a vagrant. So what do they do? They let the former master pay your fine. Now you got to go back to his plantation and work like a quote unquote slave for about six months. You get released, but you're still a vagrant. You have no job. And then the states and the counties and the cities said, hey, instead of giving that ins formerly enslaved person back to his so-called master to work off the fine, why don't we come up with something called convict leasing? And we in the county, we can lease these black people to the county cotton field, the county coal mine, the county tobacco farm, and we can work them, quote unquote, like slaves. So check out slavery by the name. Let me get back to Juneteenth before we wrap things up in two minutes. So Juneteenth was born, as I said, on June 19, 1865, and it happened when Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, and he had 1,800 Union troops to back him up. And from the Ashton Villa balcony, he read General Order Number 3. And this is what it said, quote, the people of Texas are informed that all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights between former masters and slaves, unquote. 
And let me read the rest of this so I can get it all in before we get out of here. What I write in my article in the Tribune goes like this. That's cool and everything, at least as far as it goes. But why did it take so long for our ancestors in Texas to be notified after Abe Lincoln's 1862-1863 proclamation? Well, here's the answer. Write this down. Since the capture of New Orleans by the Union Army in 1862, many worried, quote unquote, slaveholders in Mississippi, in Louisiana, and other states to the east packed up about 150,000 of their human cargo, and they sought racist sanctuary in relatively far away and lawless Texas in the Southwest, where it was believed they could escape the Union Army's reach. So they took up their property. They took up our ancestors, escaped to Texas. They thought Texas was too far away for the Union to catch up with them, and they held them there. That's why it took so long. Finally, let me say this before we get out of here. We must follow the lead of our ancestors and the elders who did the right thing after Juneteenth. What they do, they purchase land in Texas for year round Juneteenth related activities. That land includes Emancipation Park in Houston in 1872. It includes Booker T. Washington Park in Mexia in 1898, another Emancipation Park in East Austin in 1909, and finally Stringfellow Orchards in Hitchcock, Texas in 2005. We want to do the same kind of thing here in Philadelphia at Malcolm X Park in Philly at 52nd and Pine. We want to be able to own that and make that the official site of Juneteenth. We also want to fight to make sure it's a national holiday. I want to thank Gary Shepard. I want to thank you all. I want to thank our producer, Roland, and I am out of here. Let me end this like I end most of these shows. Correction, all these shows. It goes like this. Think Black. I'm out.